So welcome to V2 Embeddings Part 2. You have an earlier video that uh, kind of starts out all the topics we're going to be touching on today. And this should be hopefully just a quick follow-up. Command prompt. And we'll get Jupyter Lab up and running. And so I'll quick jump through. One of the examples we had last time was kind of our mid-sized data set. And so I'm going to quick get to the point I want to jump back to just with fresh data. Again, the other video goes through this much more slowly and all the code, there will be some updated code for this that I'll post a link to in the description of the video. And we'll leave this. One of the things I wanted to quick touch on was in the last video I talked about how I was seeing a weird error message and then I came up with kind of this quick fix to deal with it. I'll show you that error message again if you forgot or haven't seen it. And we see this also has some very basic rate limit handling here. It's incredibly crude. It's sleeping for 60 seconds every time it hits the rate limit. It's not checking have we actually gone past and here's that error message. And so the error message is blank is not valid under any of the given schemes. And what I'd found was if I go in and add in this line of code, I could, or these three lines of code, I could on the fly set any of those that were blank. So basically what this was, somewhere in here I have, so you have file name and content. Some of these had file names, but content that was completely blank. And I didn't know where it was, and I didn't really have time to track it down when I was doing the video last time. But so all this was doing was going anytime it found a field that was blank. So if that text field was blank where the content is, it would go and write blank into that field. And then it was also going and printing out blank content field detected. I'd commented in the last video, this one is not a really great stopgap fix because one, if there were a lot of these, I was then sending these blank fields to the embeddings model for an embedding to be generated. And so it was costing me a little bit of money each time I knew kind of approximately how many there were, so I didn't really care. This was a nice quick fix to deal with that, but was not a great long-term solution. I'm gonna go to here to show you some new things. So we'll start by running this, getting to where we were. And you'll notice I've changed the code here a little bit from last time. So I've added kind of these intermediate uh, variables to store a copy. This is just to get rid of those error message we were seeing before. Technically in the guidance for pandas, it basically indicates to do things the way I was doing it previously. It couldn't guarantee that as I was iterating through the entire table and changing things simultaneously on the same version, basically there was a chance that you could have unexpected behavior and results that I wouldn't necessarily see that something went wrong. So this is one of the ways to go and get around that is I'm making, rather than last time, basically we did everything to DF. So just that initial data frame, we were making all the changes there. In this video, kind of at each successive step, I'm creating these intermediate variables. It makes it a little bit harder to follow, I think, sometimes, um, but it, it does get rid of the error message for us. So we'll clean that up. We'll click, click at DF normalize. There we are. So all our new lines are gone, cleaned up a little bit. We'll go, and so this is where I start dealing with those blanks from our other one. So we had here where we're going and grabbing the blanks. I want to deal with those early on. I also want to figure out what they are. So here's a quick so this gave me which files were actually causing the blanks, this data set. When I looked at them, what I found was I was correct with my assumption that if I was dealing with a markdown file that did not have metadata that was separated out um, by this triple dash, this does not handle that correctly. Uh, for this, I don't really care. I'm f I really was designing this intending the only types of files I wanted were those that had that triple dash. So I'm a little bit okay with that and so I'm just going to drop these. When I looked at these this first file actually was a completely blank file, the file itself, and then some of these did have a little bit of, bit of text but nothing that I really cared about enough that I needed to keep. So what I'm doing here is I'm just dropping these blanks from my data frame so then I won't be processing them with the embeddings and I don't need to worry about them. 
Uh, certainly if you were dealing with something else, you could remove that code that I'm doing. And I also have the other video I'd posted on how to do the same sort of thing with docx files or with other file types. And in that I do remove my check code for the metadata. And we'll go here now, there we are. Let's go and set, let's tokenize everything. There we go, and you, again, you can see I'm doing kind of these intermediate copy variables. So each time we're not just doing everything to DF, it's always to a copy, but it has to kind of be a new copy um, so that we're getting, if I tried doing this to DF instead of DF normalized, I'd lose all the effects that I'd done to on the normalization side. And we'll look at the cost of this. Again, that's fine. Can look at the total length. I can drop, I'm, I might go and I'll drop anything that has more than 400 tokens just for the sake of this example. So we're down to ultimately 534 articles. So we started out with 1,836 and I'm just kind of arbitrarily grabbing any of the longer articles, throwing them out uh, just for this example. So I cleaned up the rate limit code somewhat considerably to make it a little bit better and more functional. And so I'll show you what that looks like right now when that's running, just so you can see. So one, I'm keeping a count throughout of seeing has 60 seconds elapsed. And so actually it's gonna be easier to see. I'll stop it really quick, it'll take it a second. So let's set it to a 10 second rate or 20 second rate limit since that's something that I think someone with a free account would be on a 20 second rate limit. And we'll start that and see, or 20 requests per minute rate limit rather. So we'll get to our 20 requests and then you can see, so it took us six seconds to get there. So then we sleep for 54 seconds. So this is a little bit more intelligent in that before it was just a, it really wasn't even truly, it was just kind of interrupting and sleeping every so many requests, but it wasn't keeping track of where are we in that 60 second uh, request kind of window that we're allowed to do things. So we'll sleep for 54 seconds, then we'll send 20 more requests then. And so it's going to adapt to how fast things are actually being sent. I'll stop that and set it back to something slightly more reasonable. Let's set it to a rate limit of 100. It's going to take it a second to stop. It's still running. It will get that keyboard interrupt eventually, but there we go. Detects that I stopped it. So we'll start this again with a rate limit of 100. So we're going to send 100 requests if we can in under 60 seconds. So this is just keeping track of how much time has elapsed. This is our total request sent. So as long as it takes us to get up to 100, then it will stop. And then whatever we have left in, so this is basically telling us that we're allowed to send 100 requests per minute. And then it will stop and then it will sleep for the remaining time. There we go. So we got 35 seconds to send the 100 total requests and now we're going to sleep for 25 more seconds. So theoretically, if we had a rate limit there, since this account has existed for more than 48 hours at this point, I'm no longer on the 60 second rate limit. I now have a rate limit of 3000. Theoretically, you should be able to hit that. I have found on average, I'm hitting about 500 requests, somewhere between 400 to 500 requests per minute is just the max of how quickly things will send. There is a degree to which just all the things we're doing here are slowing things down a little bit. Uh, so the actual request rate, if we weren't doing this constant refreshing of the screen and kind of adding some layers onto the loop here, this would go faster. But, and so you can see what happens as well. Once we hit 60 seconds, it resets the request counter there. So if we're able to get to 60 seconds without ever hitting the rate limit, you start over there, but we're still keeping track of the total request count. So this is, again, not, not in any way as robust as some of the samples that OpenAI has on their site, but something that's a little bit easier to keep in your head to follow what it's doing. And so if you need just very basic rate limit handling to play around with embeddings, this can be a good option to be able to play with. I'll stop this. We don't need to go and run all the way through. The last thing I wanted to quick touch on was 
when I showed the large example in the previous video, and this one had, let's see, so it came out to over 53 million tokens, and I had basically said, this is just going to take too long to do without batching, and what was completely not processing in my brain, because I was tired and doing this at about 1 to 2 a.m. my local time as I was recording the video, is really in this case the number of tokens was irrelevant and the thing that I needed to care about was how many articles was I sending and kind of the articles being a one-to-one -one with the requests. So really what I needed to care about is that I had 23,878 articles and so then that becomes a basically I can absolutely send that with my current script without doing anything else. The limitation really being that it's even though technically I get 3,000 requests per second, I'm not actually functionally running that fast. So like the, the hypothetical fastest it could run would be this number divided by 3,000, 23878 divided by 3,000, 7, 7 7.9 minutes. So theoretically that's the fastest it could be, but I'm not getting that type of throughput when I'm sending. And that, that that's not a function of network speed. It's just a function of these calls happen one after another because I'm not doing any sort of parallelization or anything else. And there is the slight delay of me hitting the API and then the API calculating and embedding and then sending it back to me. But having, a, I, I don't think me having much faster internet would really make a difference there. But with that said, so what I was finding was, and so this is in seconds. So generally, depending on what I was doing, I found it was anywhere between 90 minutes to two hours was how long it would take. I found that it did run faster if I commented out all of my old monitoring code. So in the same way, in like all of this new code that is going and handling the rate limit if i don't need that because my rate limit is technically 3000 and i'm only hitting about 400 requests to 500 requests per second if i comment all of this part of it out or, or at least all of the all of the parts i don't need so we still need this and we still need this but we could technically comment out all of that and this will run a little bit faster and then so when i did that i was able to go and do the full embeddings for all 52 or 53 million tokens because it was only at 23,000 articles granted again still you probably want to start thinking about batching playing around being able to do retry but i did want to correct that from the last video because that was completely incorrect when i went and said oh it's got 53 million tokens we can't possibly do this without doing something a little more advanced it will work it just takes two hours. This is the quick update. Hopefully I will post the updated code that has the new rate limit handling, as well as if you need to investigate blank, if you ran into something similar and had uh, some blank data and needed to dig in and figure out, wait, where is that? What's going on? And so you can see, I, I don't think I really went through this, but I added the code checking for if it's blank. If we have a totally blank article, then go and write blank here as part of the normalization code. And then after that, was able to go and flag those and bring those back to look at. But hopefully you're enjoying. I'll have some more content coming out soon. Uh, thank you so much for watching and like and subscribe if you enjoy.